from Microbe TV. This is Tweevo. This Week in Evolution, episode number 95, recorded on November 14th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, sipping some beverage in a cup, Nels LD. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, wetting the whistle, as they say. To tea or water for... or, or bourbon <clears throat> or what? All of the above. No, this is just hot tea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, well, either it's a warm up or I'm going to run out of gas here. I was just coming off a lecture in uh, ah. Mike Shapiro's evolution and development class. I do a cameo generally once a year. Introduce, indoctrinate, introduce the um, <laughs> first year uh, undergrad students here to the Red Queen hypothesis as that ah, relates to evolution. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> and so I'm just coming off my e-bike from main campus to medical campus to join you. And I have to say, Vincent, it's great to be back together. We were, um, oh, yeah, we were absolutely. a little bit delayed in getting this on the calendar between both of our busy schedules. Yep. Yeah. Good to yeah. be back and we'll yeah. keep it up from now on folks. Welcome everyone. And let me thank our moderators today, Barb Mac UK, Tom, from Eugene, Oregon, and uh, Steph from San Francisco, and Les from California. Thank you all for coming and moderating and making this a civil place to be. And welcome everyone else from wherever you are throughout the world. And yeah. we're, we're going to forego the um, usual mm. where are you from because we need to shut this down in an hour. <laughs> I have a place to go, and I'm sorry about that, but not at all. We'll get you I... succinct science. How's that for a tagline? <laughs> Let's do that. That uh, cuts ag against our brand, where we're generally all over the map, rambling and enjoying the camaraderie. We'll continue to enjoy that. We'll just sort of truncate it a little bit. Partially uh, um, my fault too. I we uh, delayed a half hour so that I could get in this lecture. So now. Uh, Les and Barb Mack want to know what Red Queen is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fantastic. So the, um, you know, a long answer starts with the author Lewis Carroll from the book Through the Looking Glass. We're now talking about Alice in Wonderland, etc. But there's a great line from Through the Looking Glass where the Red Queen was one of the characters says to Alice, takes all the running you can do mm. to stay in the same place. And so evolutionary biologists and more recently, Virologists, evolutionary virologists, uh, evolutionary infection biologists have uh, grabbed that line as it relates to evolution at host infectious microbe interfaces, where mutation and selection is all the running you can do. And to stay in the same place is gets at the recurrent nature of these so-called molecular arms races that we sometimes decipher um, from the evolution comparative approach is looking at the evolution of our immune systems and the evolution of populations of infectious microbes like viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. And, you know, for, both, for both to exist, they both have to run in place because if one wins, that's the end of the story, right? <laughs> that's right. We're still here. And whether we like it or not, the infectious microbes are still here. And honestly, without the infectious microbes, I don't think we would be here. Um, if you wipe out one side, this, this is really, I think we're increasingly learning about how sort of the process evolution, the motion of evolution really involves the interactions of genomes that sort of provoke all of this interesting diversification selection on complexity related traits that extends from our immune systems all the way to other genes encoding the core functions, the core machines that make our cells tick. So yeah, no, the Red Queen has been a really useful framework for um, thinking about <clears throat> how to decipher uh, evolutionarily consequential events from genome comparisons that um, sort of my lab subscribes to a number of other ones do. And so we were um, pitching that around. And I have to say, it's always like just really fun and refreshing to hang out with undergrads. Um, great questions, great just, you know, sort of throws you off your game from sort of the expert level <laughs> into novice level where honestly, the more of our professional careers as scientists we can spend at novice level, the better, because we're probably thinking about things in new ways, useful ways to sort of actually discover something new and interesting. Yeah. 
All right. Yes. Uh, we assume everyone knows our, our phrases, but in fact, you don't. And explain <laughs> no. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Yep. Well, Vincent, why don't we jump right in? As I'll do. even uh, refrain from um, drinking some more delicious tea here to kick us off on our paper today. I'm, I'm excited about this one. So, and I should just say that class I was teaching was with uh, Mike Shapiro, who you can find on Twivo. One of our early interviews was with Mike. He's the pigeon guy. So I think the title, <laughs> I, I, I can't remember offhand. It's something like um, Pigeon Fashion Week Fancy Boots Edition. He's yeah, taken all of this right. artificial <laughs> selection that pigeon breeders have done for decades and even centuries and started to get at the genetic basis of this, all of this art, like how do traits sort of evolve their involved in development of all these morphological features. And so, um, yeah, Mike is running this class. You could check out, you can check him out on Twivo. Um, I don't have the episode number on the tips of my fingertips, but if you do a search, you'll find him. So, um, moving, I guess, away from directly the red queen, although the red queen's probably hiding somewhere here, um, under the dirt. Um, today we're going to, um, talk about watering our viruses. So, so, uh, <laughs> viral, but not bacterial community successional patterns reflect extreme turnover shortly after rewetting dry soils. And so <laughs> before we all kind of try to unpack why I think this is really exciting and, um, important research to consider, to weigh, to discuss among the Twivo community here. Um, but first let's set up the, um, or, um, you know, note the authors. So this is coming from Joanne Emerson's lab. I believe she is in the department of plant pathology at the university of California, Davis. Mm -hmm. The study was led by Christian Santos Medellin, who, um, I think has now finished his postdoc and is working at a company that does plant genetics. Um, Steven, uh, Blazovich, Jennifer Pet Ridge, Mary Firestone, um, collaborating with the Emerson Lab here. And the article just dropped. I think there's a sort of a preprint and maybe uh, advance online with a little bit of um, interesting press coverage, which I think originally caught my eye. Um, but you can find this in the current issue of Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, November 2023. Um, fortunately, it's uh, not an open access scenario, but the preprint, which is largely the same as the final copy, is available on the bioarchive if you want to do a deeper dive for yourself into the data here. And so, you know, I think one of the reasons this paper kind of captured my imagination, Vincent, is uh, I think we're all probably familiar with that great after a rainstorm smell. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. even a, <laughs> there's even a word for this, um, petrichor, I think, where it is especially pronounced after, if it's been a dry spell or a drought, and then the rains fall and it's almost like, okay. yeah, it's almost like this burst of, I don't know, I think it touches the, some of our synapses as humans in a way um, that has sort of intrigued um, evolutionary biologists, anthropologists, et cetera. I think today we're going to try to draw maybe even a viral link to some of this, um, some of this strong connection. Uh, I'm going to go way out on a limb here and say that this might be the first natural form of phage therapy where um, after a rainstorm, we breathe in deeper, deeply the soil viruses that sort of pop up and bloom up as we'll see from the data today. Mm -hmm. And could this even be sort of a natural antibiotic scenario for the potentially pathogenic microbes that hang out in our lungs? I don't know. That's going, I'm now way over my yeah, skis as, as, so could as be, we say. <laughs> I mean, it could be that this is phage therapy for the soil, right? To get the, because you throw that water on and things, mm -hmm. bacteria start multiplying uncontrollably and then the phage are there to get the populations in order, right? You could look at it that way. You can look at it that way. And already the title of the paper, I think is starting to hint at this. Um, although maybe in with, um, some twists and turns or a curveball here or there. So viral, but not bacterial community yeah. successional patterns. And so that might be the first surprise. So I think, so anyway, um, Let's uh, first things first, let's actually t talk about the set up the paper here, go through it, and then we can kind of speculate and daydream about some of the implications here. Um, but we've discussed this a few times, Vincent, over the years on Twivo and actually in person, for example, at the giant virus meeting where we were a few years back, um, learning about the viral shunt. And so this is now we're moving away from the soil into marine ecosystems, into the oceans. And this, these recent um, really, you know, I 
I'd say groundbreaking kind of um, game changing observations based largely on metagenomics and similar analysis, um, pointing to the idea that marine viruses every day turn over something like 40% of the microbes. And this has a massive impact on the carbon cycle in oceans in terms of nutrient availability. Um, and so there's this, you know, kind of right under our, um, under our noses, this um, massive predator prey cycle happening on a daily basis. Um, but most of what we know about this is in the oceans. And in part, because those are relatively easy ecosystems to sample and to characterize. And so I'd say the field is sort of, you know, pretty far along in terms of um, sort of grappling with some of the impacts, the massive impacts of the viruses. And, and as they, and these are the viruses largely of bacteria and other uh, microorganisms, phages that are having such a massive impact on life on earth. Less is known about uh, what's going on in the soil, but it's not um, because there aren't viruses there. I think some estimates have um, the soil containing 10 to the 10 viruses per gram, which is not a small number. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> Think about it. that next time you're in your garden shoveling dirt, all those billions of viral particles that are getting thrown around, right? I know. And that's, again, kind of what kind of got my attention on this paper, too, is that, you know, after those rain events, and we'll set this up a little better, but it's to now think about that kind of refreshing moment of the rain falling and then but mm -hmm. add in the viruses to the equation. I don't know if we're directly smelling the viruses. We actually had a fun contra, uh, kind of uh, conversation about that at a recent lab event, um, whether viruses smell. And mm -hmm. I think that's uh, potentially an interesting well, now, sort of side if they here. do they smell wonderful. <laughs> Correct. And maybe that's part of the petrichor, <laughs> this great after the rainstorm sort of aroma. The viruses might be contributing to that onto our sort of well, you factory know, now receptors. Uh, mm. Things that you smell are typically volatiles, right? Correct. So the particles, the virus particles themselves are probably not smelling. But once they infect a host, I would guess they induce the formation of volatiles that do have a smell. There you go. And so again, yeah. So if we, you know, that's, we're adding another step there, but could there be volatiles that are part of this story? Um, and we'll, we'll touch on this too, because what, how the viruses are behaving um, in their hosts, whether they're lysing them, whether they're lytic phages or lysogenic phases, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of come into the conversation. Okay. But so what I also really enjoyed about this paper is sort of um, how they framed the moment, right? So again, this is pretty well known which is um, in dry zones. So they point to the Mediterranean climate zones, including um, ones in Northern California, sort of the backyard of the Emerson lab um, at Davis, um, and how you have these long bouts. And in, you know, in drought years, it can be even longer where there, it's really dry and warm. And then it's that transition zone into the rainy season, the wet season, where it's wet and cool. And marking that very first sort of quenching rainstorm as a, as a pretty consequential event for the biology of the soil as it relates to microorganisms. Um, and so, um, you know, I think what's exciting about this paper is how they capture that moment in microcosms. And that's sort of, I think in this case, if you look at the methods of the paper, that's just a fancy word for 50 mil uh, centrifuge tube, but they're taking um, samples at four locations um, uh, that have of soils in these and you know that represent this Mered this Mediterranean climate zone and putting that sampling that bringing it into the laboratory and at the beginning of the experiment because they collected this very carefully um, near the end of the dry season or during about in the dry season the soil moisture is something like less than one percent and so then they simulate a rainstorm by just adding hmm. some water to the 50 <laughs> mil tube um, the microcosm and uh, bringing that moisture content up closer to 25%, um, which would, I think, um, you know, represent a pretty good soaking rain moving into that wet season. Um, we saw, so this was, I should say, by the way, I think this was collected around 2020. So more in drought scenario. Of course, we had this massive, or in California, there was this massive wet winter last year that really erased the drought and sort of, uh, you know, again, sort of speaks to maybe some of these ancient human connections on the rainy season and bringing in sort of more the possibility of growing crops, et cetera, um, that might also tie to sort of our deep psychological connection to the, the smell of a, of a fresh rainstorm. Um, but that was it. So it's, you know, I think it's basically by taking these four distinct grassland habitats, 
simulating that rainfall, kind of containing it in the laboratory. It's really this nice example that we're seeing more and more in work that we feature on Twivo, where we're going to the ecosystems, really identifying the key features of them, and then sort of meeting them halfway with a laboratory you know, um, approach to be able to try to capture or describe or manipulate um, some of this, some of these ecological parameters to understand better all of these um, impactful events that might be going on sort of invisibly um, in ecosystems like this. And so, you know, the other thing I'd say, Vincent, that this group has done, which sort of distinguishes this paper, is to start to put together kind of a combination of, um, you know, genomics approaches and to draw comparisons that might help to make more incisive, um, you know, or come to a more incisive understanding of what's going on. And I'd say, you know, let's, um, I'm excited, but, you know, let's also, we, we want to use our sort of critical, uh, constructive criticism or critical eyes as scientists. It's a sort of a work in progress. It's definitely an advance, but in some sense, there's in, a lot of good science has this sort of energy. There is, you know, as, as more questions or as many questions as there are answers um, as we step through um, the analysis here um, today on Twivo. And so um, the, just mechanically then, we've, we've got our um, microcosms. They're collected at different locations at these four grassland habitats. Um, they've now been re-wetted and then it's in that sort of time frame now that starts the clock basically on 10 days worth of analysis from basically right after the wet up um, and then using those samples um, you know to allow the experiment to continue pull down one microcosm at a time and then um, start to isolate nucleic acids do different genomic analysis to try to get at what might be going on here in, t in terms of that soil dynamic as it relates to the phages the bacteria um, and related um, critters microbial critters that are that are there and then, and maybe, you know, so it's that, I think it's that definition of that sort of that pivotal point where there's this kind of dynamic in those communities at a microbial level, and then capturing that over 10 days is, sort of frames this biology really nicely. Um, I guess the big surprise, maybe the take home, which we've already gotten to in a sense, which is in the title of the paper is, you know, so as they're doing the sequencing, and so they're basically doing metagenomes. Um, they're getting to mags. We've talked about this metagenomic uh, assembled genomes. Um, uh, also doing, um, uh, you know, uh, 16S sequencing. So this helps to get at the diversity, especially among the bacteria. It's hard to get entire bacterial genomes because you have to sequence so deep. You have all of these mm -hmm. data sets, all of the replicates um, as a way to start to get a sense of who's there kind of at a catalog um, level. And then um, uh, based on the ribosomal profiles that can help to, to identify the groups of bacteria that are present or absent. And then finally, you know, sort of the interesting thing that they include here is either doing that um, analysis with uh, DNAs treatment or without. And so this gets at another sort of set of nucleic acids that they identify as relic DNA. And the notion here is that this would be largely composed of bacteria, um, you know, genomes or fragments of genomes of recently lysed um, cells. So dead cells, basically material over this, you know, and, and remember, so it's this long dry spell, in some cases up to like more than a year, actually, because of the drought conditions, um, kind of breaking the seasonal pattern to some degree. Um, and the day to day predator prey relationships, which are going to lead to not just um, genomes that are sort of actively replicating in living creatures or in, you know, productively packaged virus genomes, but all of the, you know, sort of dead stuff or fragments along the way. And so the DNA's treatment is meant to remove that population of relic DNA, since it's um, not going to be protected by the cell membrane of a bacteria or from the particle, you know, sort of a productive particle of a virus. Um, and it's, it's in that comparison that then they can, they can also draw um, some ideas out about the composition of the communities there and how that might change in terms of the predator prey that's happening in the course of that sort of pivotal event, the rainstorm after the long dry season. Um, okay, so that kind of sets the table, I would say. And then operationally in the end, I think they say that they are able to generate 144 viromes. That's like, uh, um, I think each is a sample, 84 ribosomal profiles. That accounts for more than 10,000 viral OTUs. These are 
viral operational taxonomic units, which you see um, as a representation sort of a potentially approaching a species level or a group level, um, just based on sequencing as opposed to like culturing the more traditional approaches um, of microbiologists. Um, and, and of those 10,000 or so viral OTUs or VOTUs, about a quarter of them have predicted hosts. And I wanted to pause here because I think that's an important point, which is, you know, again, how little we know about what's right under our nose in terms of, you know, who are these things infecting? What are these things and who are they infecting? So sort of our infancy in understanding the biodiversity around us, especially at the microbial level. And so it's almost like, you know, tip of the iceberg. And even some of the patterns that we're seeing might be more like outliers than sort of the general rule because of our the just our limited knowledge of microbiology in the environment. Um, so in the end, this is they end up with um, more than 500 virus genomes from the metagenomic data, those mags. Um, and, um, you know, as I noted, it's harder to get those bacterial genomes. And so that's where they're using the 16S ribosomal amplicon. So these are pretty well over the decades, pretty well defined um, PCR primers, basically, or tags that are used to amplify a, a, a really conserved part of the genome across very diverse bacteria. And this allows the researchers to, to get a catalog, a sense of like who's there um, among the constituencies, uh, the you know constituency of mm -hmm. microbes. So um, lots of differences in conservation. So, and then of course you can draw comparisons because you have the four different sites and even the different sort of within the sites, I think you have some additional sampling there of like, you know, is it a little sort of um, valley or micro valley where pools of water might be versus a swale where it's more of a mound, things like that, which might obviously have different sort of, um, as rainstorms move through, might hold water differently and that could impact some of the dynamics as well. And so they kind of say at the top level, you, you see lots of differences in the composition. So those catalogs based on 16S, based on the virus genomes are quite different. Um, but the dynamic, um, so even though it's different, a, a, sort of a different set of viruses, a different set of bacteria. The dynamics are pretty similar right after that wet up event, the simulated rainstorm. Mm -hmm. And there's a, and in particular, there's a burst of viral richness between two to 34. Richness meaning the number of different types, right? Correct. Yeah. Viral diversity. So exactly right. So, um, and that could range in their data from two to 30 fold. Um, 30 fold is pretty impressive, right? So like yeah. if, all of a sudden that day before you have 30 X, um, less diversity and then 30 yeah. X. And that to me, that's maybe uh, <laughs> as I got out on that limb about, you know, nature's phage therapy. Um, maybe that's one of my sort of like weak branch points here is imagine that like, you know, after a rainstorm, you have 30 times the diversity of viruses that you're breathing in to your nose. And so it's like one of these moments of like, um, you know, what's possible. Yeah. Um, virologically speaking, there's, um, you're just, you're sampling a, a lot more richness there. That's really striking. I like, I, and maybe that's, you know, in some ways really the big, um, take home message here, the big advance is, is seeing that level and, but it can range all the way down to just twofold. And they correlate that with how recent the rain, um, sort of history had been at those sites. So, um, the longer the drought, I think in one case it was like 500 days or something at one of the sites before the you know last rainstorm the lower the virus diversity those were that was the twofold i think versus if it was on a more seasonal pattern or more recently than that that was up and so that kind of speaks again to this like really interesting ecological dynamic um that i think is uh, i mean i'm not an ecologist so um don't take my word for it but um sort of like these understudied patterns and how here it would be you know in that day-to-day -day sort of phage predation or persistence, how long that can persist and what that means for diversity, how quickly is that recoverable? It starts to hint at, I think, some of the, you know, not just the timing of this, but the space, like how do these things move um, uh, as different events or, or as the soil is disrupted or things like that are happening and do, does the diversity sort of recover? Um, I think this, again, this sort of opens up a lot of those cool questions for future research um, to think about um, going beyond just this first sampling, which is a lot to begin with, but then to, you know, start to manipulate the system even more to get at sort of the key um, pressure points of these dynamics. Um, what I found yeah. interesting, if I may. Yeah, of course, it. please. So the, the viral DNA in the two of the dry soils were 
you couldn't see them. You can't find it in the dry soil. And then most of the OTUs that you find after wetting, you don't see those in the dry soil. So the question arises is where are they coming from, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. You had yeah. water. It's not just making virus particles. They have to come from somewhere. So they're not from free viral particles present in the soil. That's the key. And That's right. one, one alternative is that they're lysogens, right? So a lot of those bacteria in the soil may have viral genomes integrated into them. And yep. then when you add water, they begin to reproduce and the viral gene, the viral particles are produced. But it, their analysis says no. <laughs> their analysis says no. I would take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. So, you know, yeah, I think yeah. they're kind of, yep, they're pushing up a little bit against the limits of what you can learn with this kind of metagenomic analysis. But yeah, the key features that you might have expected that would suggest exactly that. I think they, you know, they suggest another interesting possibility is pseudo uh, lysogeny. And so the idea here would be that somehow there's this like persistence state. I'm probably like, I might be overinterpreting it, but almost like a semi hibernation where yeah. the virus, right? Like the viruses sort of persist in a host cell or they're, they're kind of have suspended the replication process, but are sort of poised. Um, and that could speak to maybe a little bit of that twofold V 30 fold difference. Um, yeah. Yeah. If that, pro you know, there's only so long you can hibernate before that kind of um, those, the, the host would sort of die out or the, um, the ability of the virus population to replicate would sort of degrade um, given some time. But I think, again, that sort of points to one of these mysteries that the that the study kind of doesn't necessarily solve, but sort of raises yep. in an interesting way. Um, yep. Yeah. And there's a, one or two more like that that I think are fun to, to sort of chew on or, or, or consider as well. I think what surprised them um, from the sort of first pass of the analysis was that, um, you know, in contrast to, for example, that 30 fold increase in virus richness, there wasn't a 30 fold increase in bacterial richness. Yeah, yeah. And right. And so that was sort of the, the viruses are really kind of doing the hustling here versus the bacteria. Um, and then, you know, maybe a surprise on top of that was then as you march through those 10 days and sample as you go, you might expect as the viruses are perking up like crazy from a diversity standpoint. And I think also just from a like kind of accumulation standpoint, um, that then there would be a lot more uh, predation going on. And so you might see like the viruses spike, then the um, bacteria, you know, if there's sort of a wave, then they would come down and sort of crash out as yeah. you have this sort of over exuberant level of, of the viruses arriving. Um, but they don't see that in the data. And so that, you know, again, a couple of possibilities here. One is that the um, genomic tools just aren't quite up to the job to, for teasing out that higher of a resolution um, yeah. process based on the sort of the complexity of the uh, microcosm. Um, alternatively, um, you know, something else is going on here. And that's actually what they kind of put forward, which I think is a really interesting idea. Um, they call it the um, call the winner hypothesis. And so um, the, hmm. I guess, you know, one, one working idea, which has um, gained some prominence of the field is kill, kill the winner um, hypothesis. So basically that would be um, a signal that you would expect to see where if the viruses were basically over consuming or were being effective predators that were what would wipe out basically the bacteria that were uh, in the soil there, they'd be vulnerable to complete crash scenarios. Right. And so call the winner, um, you know, and some of the data supports the idea that, um, oh yeah, maybe they are doing some predation on these, you know, sort of the um, bacterial representatives, the major um, species or groups of bacteria, but they're kind of doing it at a, in a more balanced level where you don't see um, those getting wiped out. There's actually another one or two sort of, um, there's the um, hitchhike, the winner is another one. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just not an ecologist. I don't know actually what that one is all about, but um, I love it. I kind of love that creativity just in sort of thinking about how to yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Define or capture. There's a little bit of an echo of the Red Queen, right? It's somehow yeah. we have these sort of analogies or, um, uh, you know, sort of hypotheses that we draw and kind of give them clever titles that sort of gives it a little bit of poetry almost. So, you know, Vincent, there was another pattern here that I think um, they, that they saw repeatedly at different sample sites that is also a little bit mysterious. And that gets back to that relic DNA. Um, right. And right. yeah, right. And so, um, so again, the way they try to account for this or differences in relic DNA is by comparing the samples where they've done a DNA's treatment, which should um, mm -hmm. sort of pull away all of the relic DNA versus a non-DNA 
DNAs. And DNAs is a enzyme that's chopping up all of the DNA that's vulnerable, that's not sort of tucked away inside of a right, living bacteria right. or in a virus particle. And so then you can subtract that away and then ask, um, you know, what, how much relic DNA is there? And so what they see is now if they do that after, both before and after the um, rain simulation, the wet up, that a lot of the relic DNA falls off immediately after kind of in those early time points after they um, get the soil wet. And so, you know, they mentioned a couple ideas around here. My um, reading of it was, it was a little danced around. So, you know, either there could be um, in the discussion, they mentioned maybe there's uptake of the relic DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, As nutrients, who, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe that would happen like in that dynamic of like kind of all of life is perking up. And so this becomes food um, for things up there or even degradation of the DNA. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, this was, I think this is important and interesting. I don't know. That's another part where I think that, like kind of more questions and answers for me in, in a good way, in an interesting way. Um, you know, or for example, can you rule out things like there's, I mean, what are the, actually the DNAs is the um, nucleic acid degrading enzymes that are uh, maybe come perk up with um, as things get wet. I, I just don't know. Actually, there's just seems like many possibilities for what might be going on here. Um, Is it possible, yeah. Nels, that these uh, relic DNAs also have viral s genomes in them and mm. um, they get into cells and initiate an infectious cycle? I think so. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's possible. I think what's the um, sort of notion of the relic DNA would be that these that would be unlikely um, yeah. that that would be in a big number. But whether that, I mean, that's I think that's a great open question as well. Is like in those thirty fold um, upticks of diversity, does any of that connect to the relic DNA? I don't know if they did that analysis um, or if the answer is yeah, yes or no, or we haven't looked yet. That would be super cool. Um, yeah, and so. Um, because there are viral genomes in the relic DNA, it's clear. Oh right? yeah, for sure, absolutely, that's right. And so that's you know you've got kind of the whole churn of um, of uh, yeah viruses that are not in particle like are no longer protected from particles. All of sort of the failed or like in in the course of replicating, and then a cell that lyses, a bacterial cell, a host cell that lyses, and then this is all kind of you know vulnerable, of course, to degradation um, immediately. Um, but why it's different, right? So like if it was just sort of nucleases acting in the soil, um, yep. Yep. I think you would like, why is that different after things get wet? I think that like, um, yeah, like we're saying either there could be a, like, um, other things are perking up and using this as food or, um, you know, a difference in sort of the nuclease activity from dry to wet. Um, also as a, with their time points, with their increasing time points. Initially, relic DNA goes away, but then it comes back up again later on. Yeah, that's right. They say maybe you know, as the as the bacteria reproduce, then they contribute to some more. Maybe they get lysed by bacteria, and that's making relic DNA, right? Correct. Yeah, exactly. And that also speaks to. I mean, that's. An, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an important part of the signal here or the pattern, which is that it's not just down. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's within that ten days that it's rebounding, which also speaks to the dynamics here. Of the interactions that are happening um, between the viruses and the microbes, um, they also, you know, they're they're starting to get at um, a lot of it in terms of the classification is a little bit top level. Um, they mm -hmm. do though define it at least into three categories um, to infer some of the dynamics among the viral communities. So they have the dominant dry, the early responders, and the late responders, yeah. um, and they can kind of categorize those to like so that also gets at a little bit of the kind of succession plan, if you will, um, as that event sort of triggers this. I love that phrase they use, the, an ecosystem reset um, when yeah, the rains good. come. I like that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It really yeah, is. Pretty great. And, you know, the other thing is the the bacteria are quite different. They look at higher mm. taxonomic levels. And then in the dry soil, you mostly have actinobacteria. Yeah. And then uh, with wetting, you get more proteobacteria. And then for both, you get viruses that infect either one. And and Elio Schechter always used to say the smell you mm. you smell after you wet soil is actinobacteria, but maybe it's actually proteobacteria. Yeah, or actinobacteria that are infected 
uh, where the viruses are directing a Could volatile be. organic. <laughs> yeah. um, and that gets at that call of the winter idea since the, I mean, some of the, one of the figures you can kind of see that um, as you're saying, the um, dynamics shift somewhat, but everyone is still home. The, you know, no one is getting yeah. eradicated. They're not, not going down to zero um, based on the 16S uh, signals there. I think what would have been really fun or, or you know, again, what, um, so I mentioned, I think at the, at, kind of at the top that you've got this, um, really interesting, how do you take the complexity of an event in a complex ecosystem using that ecosystem reset mm -hmm. moment to start to get there and then kind of approaching it from the laboratory side where you put this into a microcosm, now you control the events and then you, you know, you've kind of captured that in a sample. And then you use sort of the different genomic tricks. If the genomics was more powerful and I'm like already like, this is sort of, you know, when you, I don't know, when you're like flying in an airplane at 35,000 feet and you're complaining because you're like texting your friend and you're like, yeah, the internet's so slow. And it's like, well, yeah, but you're, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you're flying, you know, literally above Iceland or something like that. And you're texting your buddy. You just sort of forget sometimes like you still want yeah. better yeah. or you want more. Right. And so I think that, apl that applies here, sort of the human impulse, um, where kind of, kind of to go from the, here are the classes or families to really direct, here's the virus that infects this exact, mm -hmm. you know, species mm -hmm. of bacteria. And then to reproduce some of these patterns. So if it really is call the winner versus kill the winner, et cetera, to sort of, can you, re, can you, can you kind of see that on a plate in some yep, cases, yep. if there are ones that are domesticatable. And so um, you got to start somewhere. And I think this paper goes a long way towards um, starting to sort of frame out what's possible and sort of like, you know, what kind of analysis you can get um, with sort of techniques at hand. And already this is a massive amount of data, but um always hungry for more and to really get that high resolution view where you can maybe pinpoint some of the um, really consequential events here and go even deeper. So this is, these are uh, very specific ecosystems where you're dry for periods and then you get rewetting. So they're using those as models to try and understand shifts, right? As we've been discussing, but not all environments do that. It's important to remember that many environments are stable. Uh, this is just a way, as they say, there is a change, and so we can measure the change as a, as opposed to when it's all stable, we don't actually know what's going on. Yeah, that's right. So like that's kind of um, almost the natural equivalent of the experimentalists provoking or manipulating mm -hmm. the system to, mm -hmm. to cause something, which I really exactly, exactly right. I really like that. I'd be a little bit cautious. So the notion of like a stable system, like I think that's like a pretty um, you know intuitively attractive thing to think about. Um, but how much, including like, just as you know, when you and I show up on YouTube um, live streaming and look at each other, it's like, oh, there's Vincent. He looks exactly the same as last month. There's Nels. He looks the same as last mm -hmm. month. But our cells are all different, right? I mean, so are we even stable, um, you know, as uh, individuals? No, we're constant. Everything is con even things that appear stable are constantly changing. That's the other thing that I'm, I'm really curious about. Um, from this study is in those dry seasons, you know, mm. how much of how much turn how much coal the winter is going on there, or you know, or is it is it really kind of this sort of pseudo hibernation state? Some, you know, or maybe for the majority of the population constituents, maybe that answer is yes. But there, are there some that are continuing to churn away? Probably also yes. And so that's also feels like we're sort of glimpsing at. Um, sort of either side of the the dynamic and and what goes on there. I think that that will be really interesting to see in future studies as well. So I want to um, just just remind listeners. So the idea here again is that in the oceans we know that there's massive turnover, right? Which yeah. is uh, uh, forty percent of the hosts are killed by viruses each day. This has implications for carbon cycles, as Nell said. Question yeah. is, in the soil, do we see the same thing? And this is an attempt to use. A, a model system to address that, right? You put water on dirt or soil, I should say, and suddenly you have changes in viral communities. And so the next thing they could do is to address how does that affect carbon cycling in the soil, right? Yeah, correct. And so, um, and I don't think that, um, I think they hint at that. Um, my sense, and you know, I'm curious to what you what you got from it too, is that it doesn't seem quite as extreme, or certainly not as noticeable or apparent yeah. 
as the as in the marine system the viral shunt and so then the question becomes how much of that is like real biology being different which i'm sure it is um to some degree um versus just the challenges of sort of capturing this ecosystem relative to the marine one and i don't know that i have i just don't have the background i mean i'm like both um it was steve wilhelm that we met and curtis subtle at the mm. um, giant virus meeting um I just haven't followed that work closely enough to like, you know, the advantages of the marine system in terms of just technically relative to the soil system. Um, and, you know, how much of that is just the resources that scientists have put in um, versus the, you know, really the technical hurdles to, to really get a clean picture here of um, who's, um, who's preying on who and, and how impactful that is in terms of that, like, you know, is it 40% turnover level? I think that would still fall under call the winner, but versus, I guess, I don't, action in, um, uh, in that viral shunt in oceans, um, I'm not sure if that dynamic is also considered call the winner or kill the winner, um, whether there are sort of those, like 40% obviously is a, is a huge average over yeah. an incredible amount of complexity that, that is sort of glossing over all of the details there in a big way. Well, I mean, when you think about there's a lot of water on Earth, right? But there's a lot of dirt also. <laughs> so it can make significant <laughs> contributions to, say, carbon cycles, right? Because they say when when you get that first rainfall, you get a burst of carbon dioxide production. So um, That's right. I, just, I think we just haven't studied it. And this is one of the first attempts to do that. And we should not uh, be surprised if it turns out that there's a huge impact of the soil on carbon cycles just as there is for oceans i mean oh yeah see right i i agree i mean the one thing that's kind of an obvious difference here is for the viral shunt in oceans this is kind of a 24-hour cycle or like you know um and in this case it's a more seasonal scenario the transitions from a dry season to a wet season back to yeah, yeah, yeah. a dry season and so it doesn't have that sort of maybe daily tempo um, that the marine sort of system, and that probably has a big impact on the dynamics as well. Um, and whether you, you know, the, the, certainly some differences in that sort of at a, at a more global scale. So this, yeah. this paper doesn't involve dogs. So I think our, our listeners are a little <laughs> subdued, right? Probably, they there's been no chatter. And, um, you know, I understand that jo dogs are very, uh, you know, they get you excited and so forth, but why, why is this? impactful <laughs> because uh, these these tiny organisms, the bacteria and the yeah. viruses, can influence global cycles, right? Mm -hmm. That's clear from what's going on uh, in the oceans. And it may also be a feature of, of dirt or soil. And that's why we, we did this paper, because this is a nice attempt to try and start to study that, right? And then you know, hopefully yeah. people get, in, get uh, inspired to do that. So you know, if you took away all of the viruses from the oceans, uh, <laughs> what happens? Well, you, there are two opinions. At the Quebec City mm. uh, Oceanic Virus Meeting that I went to early this year, mm. I asked the panelists the question. And one nice. guy said, I think the oceans would actually um, readjust because biology, mm. biological systems are pretty flexible. And Curtis Suttle got up and said, I'm willing to say that everything would stop <laughs> you know, if you took away all the viruses. So yeah, yeah. You know, I love different, it. Yeah. different opinions. So you could have the same idea for if you took out all the viruses from the soil, what would happen? Probably be some kind of major impact on uh, ecosystems. What it exactly is, we don't know. But that's why this, this kind of study is interesting because it can, um, can address some of these issues. I agree. And, you, and then as you move to microcosms, you could also think about, um, you know, sort of running those experiments at a small level. So if you have specific ways of blocking yeah, phage, yeah. right? And and I also, like for me, um, you know, I already kind of confessed to like one of the reasons I thought this was exciting is just that smell after a rainstorm and thinking about like sniffing in all kinds yeah, of virus diversity, which I can't get of enough of. But so Tom yeah, says yeah. Wikipedia has a fun <laughs> That's cool. great. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also, you know, thinking about these dynamics too in ecosystems at various sort of layers of complexity. So, you know, we talk a lot about this in sort of the charismatic megafauna and like yeah. places like Yellowstone National Park, you take away the wolves, some of the 
you know, the top predators there, what happens to the other mm. species that would otherwise be the prey? And what does that mean for kind of the health or robustness of the ecosystem when you put back wolves? come back in 30 years, what kind of new patterns do you see in some cases in kind of restoration ecology? And I think, you know, at least from a first approximation, some of these patterns must apply at the microbial level too. True, and for sure. ways that are just not, again, we are largely invisible. Um, and so that's sort of one of the organizing principles of Twebo is n hmm. now that we have all of these sort of genomic scale tools at our disposal, how do we sort of look at these things, these processes that are otherwise invisible? Um, and we, in this case, not even looking at them under a microscope, but looking at them um, at a sequence level. And how far can you go in understanding some of those dynamics and the impacts based on that? And I think that's really where this paper is sort of an interesting contribution in that space. And also actually, Vincent, it sort of reminds me, maybe this is me just again, sort of coming out of, of left field here, but it reminds me a bit of our discussion not too long ago on Twebo 89. This is a paper by Allison Feeder um, and colleagues. It was on sort of the spatial dynamics of um, tumor evolution. It's the episode's oh, yeah. called the outer yeah. outer rim of tumor evolution. I'm yep. slowly yep. working my way into our other sort of recent theme, which is dogs, and we'll get we'll get there too <laughs> as it relates to dogs and tumors of dogs. Um, but um, you know, so there. Um, uh, very different application of some of these genomic techniques, but thinking about the differences in um, now that, you know, instead of that sort of complex collection of bacteria, complex collection of viruses, this is um, genetic variation within tumor cells. So it all starts out, you know, as the same tumor, but then it quickly changes and there's like geography to that again over time and space. And so, you know, I think those are interesting conversations to have too. Um, coming at it more from, you know, maybe the biomedical science angle, but using some of the same genomic scale approaches to get at some of the complex dynamics um, in different ways. And of course, some of the tools will work better, you know, in some systems and others, but that also sort of opens up a, a really interesting pathway where I think, you know, the, the science that's being done in the cancer clinic is like not that much different, at least in, in some of the um, principles and ideas as it is in soil or the kind of communities and in, in things like oceans. And so, I think, yeah, that would be a fun conversation to, um, to listen in on is sort of, or seeing those kind of fields starting to collide some of the analysis and does that sort of speak to a way forward that sort of gets at my secret. Like you hear this sort of cliche in biomedical research, which is, you know, work that goes from, um, bench to bench to bedside as sort of this pinnacle of translational biology. The experiments we do lead to a great drug or treatment or vaccine, which is great, yep. Yep. but I'd love to reverse that flow. What if there's an insight from um, bedside that goes to the rainforests? Like then we're really, I think, squeezing the value That's out of good. the science we're doing to understand the world around us, which, you know, starts to build in a positive way. Hmm. That's cool. I like that. I want to thank Abdul Aziz for his uh, contribution to science oh, communication. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> let me just briefly go through where people are from since we didn't do that. Oh, yeah, great. Upstate Manhattan. I don't know what upstate Manhattan is. It's <laughs> <That's> funny. <laughs> is that, uh, that's near the Bronx, isn't it? Well, I mean, <laughs> upstate Manhattan. Yeah, I mean, the Bronx would be all the way up there. I don't know. It could be upstate New York. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Emmy yeah. Wheeler is from Helsinki. Thank you very oh, much. Fantastic. Barb Mack is, is from welcome, the UK. Welcome. And, Good to see you, uh, Barb. MK is from Eastern Massachusetts. Other Shade is from Amsterdam. Jeff welcome, is from welcome. Santa Barbara. Boulder, Good Colorado. Italy. Wales. Sumit is from India. Welcome. Rima is from Iowa. Hi there, Piffle Rima. Piffle Prattle is from Central England. Piffle Prattle, that's good. Joseph is from Ontario, <laughs> yeah. Canada. There you go. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Yeah, Did you great. want to end up with any any picks, Nels? I don't know if you have one. Or not oh, there. I actually do. I don't know if I put it in the show notes. Um, uh, I do have one, which is um, <clears throat> the... I've been thinking about social media. So, um, you know, Twitter or X now, I guess it just feels like it's getting more and more, I don't know, weird um, and not necessarily in a good way. So I just made the move 
Vincent, not completely. I'm still kind of one foot in both worlds uh, to Blue Sky mm -hmm. um, as a possible alternative. There's been a few of these launched now, Threads versus, you know, coming yeah, through the Facebook yeah, yeah. engine. I didn't quite, I tried that and I have an account there, but I haven't been active. It's, um, I, I can't run three of these at once or something like that. But so now the latest attempt is Blue Sky. Blue have Sky. you tried that one? I haven't tried it, but yeah. uh, some people, some folks sent us some, um, you know, code so you can get a, um, an account right away. Yep. I don't know. Yep. Did you get one right away or did you have a code? I got a code. So that's the other thing that's a little bit funny about this, right? And I kind of like, actually, it's interesting. Just think about culturally how this works. So yeah, to get on Blue <laughs> Sky, either you got picked like somehow in the first beta version, or I think it's still considered in beta testing. But, and then once you're in, then they give you codes from time to time. I haven't gotten any. I'm just still. It's an old code, but it checks out now. Starting block. But um, <laughs> I do have an account now. Someone, I got a code. Um, for my colleague, no, get um, <laughs> Nathan. Oh, sorry. I missed it. <laughs> it's an old code. <laughs> it's an old code, but um, it checks out. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, got from Nathan Clark, who has been on Twivo a couple of times. We've covered some of his oh, work. Yes, anyway, right. He's been on there for a while. And I do have to say, just from a quick glance, there's a lot of science conversations perking up there. And so... Um, I think there's a lot, and that's kind of what I was missing as I was just browsing through Twitter. And, you know, I'm, I think I've confessed this before. I'm sort of hopelessly addicted to just sort of browsing the threads and trying to pick up interesting tidbits of info, um, hmm. a lot of it about science. And so that's kind of starting to get, you know, fewer and far between, but I think on blue sky, I was seeing some, some really good stuff that kind of felt like the old science Twitter to some degree. And so, um, anyway, okay. that's my yeah, science I, pick of the week. So check me out at L early bird at blue sky. L early bird. Okay. Whatever. Same, same handle as on Twitter. I, I, we, so we either have or have or plan to open because we're going to do two. We're going to do one for me, a personal kind of account where yep. I can rant and then a micro TV account. <laughs> That's Which great. Good be, idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, announcements of things that are going on when shows are released and so forth. But yeah, I don't think we've done it yet. <clears throat> but w when we do, we'll let you know. Yeah, that uh, sounds so good. And I think you will see that you'll get back to this a little bit of that science energy is starting to perk up there, bubble up there in, in a good well, way. I'd like to get back to a science energy where people don't scream and yell at each other if they don't agree, right? I mean, just Ugh. say you disagree yeah. for this reason civilly. It's it's nice to have a civil conversation. It just feels good. You know, I was up at Montreal yeah. at McGill last week and we had a nice mm -hmm. twiv and I was thinking, you know, we're having this lovely conversation. Everyone's civilized and yeah. it's really nice. So that's what yep. I would like uh, social media. To, instead of you say something and someone says, you jackass, you don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. You're getting money from big pharma. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Just stop yep. it. I'm I don't think blue sky will be immune to um, no. some of those patterns, but at least it's not kind of all, completely off the rails. Not so yet. You, you know, they'll all the come case, and but... it'll be all contaminated. It's like, <laughs> you know, you have a fermenter and they all end up getting contaminated eventually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a succession plan. That's for sure. Just add yeah. water. How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? So I have a book that I got a few weeks ago. Uh, some, from time to time, people send me books. Mm -hmm. And this one is interesting by Gregory Morgan. It's called Cancer Virus Hunters, A History of Tumor Virology. Oh, wow. And, you know, about 20% of uh, human cancers are caused by tumor viruses. Do you know, Nels, what the top yeah. two are? Ooh. Um, is EBV in the conversation? No, it's not a top one. No. <laughs> okay. I'm already. I'm I give already, you a uh, hint. We have a vaccine uh, for both of uh, them. Okay. So papilloma. Right. Virus causing um, tumors. And then the second one, oof, I'm drawing a blank. Help me out. So um, you could get this one from tattoo, a dirty tattoo needle. Uh, it target is your liver. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that prevalent. Yeah, hepatitis B virus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Big okay. Uh, cause of sense. hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, this is um, huh. a nice historical book, which looks at the people who over the years, you know, discovered viruses that caused cancers in, in various <laughs> experimental systems, mm -hmm. you know, like um, Ross Peyton Rouse. Yeah. Peyton Rouse um, 
finding a chicken sarcoma causing virus, which yeah. eventually led to the whole oncogene hypothesis, right? Where there are proteins that regulate cell division and they can go awry and cause uh, cells to divide forever, which is a recipe for getting a cancer. So yeah. he, he goes through the history and it's very nice. He covers all the different discoveries and talks about the people. He, here he's talking about the discovery of reverse transcriptase. And he said, Very Baltimore cool. had chutzpah. He thought nothing of bouncing around from lab to lab, picking up the skills he needed. As he put it, I was on a fast track in life, building hmm. myself up so I could become the person I wanted to be. Hmm. Wow. That is chutzpah, right? To say something that like is. that. That's for sure. Is that consistent with your uh, observations of the uh, scientist? <clears throat> I, I think, no, I, I just saw someone who was intellectually very strong. Mm -hmm. He had a mm -hmm. strong personality, but, I, you know, I didn't see him in his form. By the time I saw him, he was already formed, right? He had all the yeah. skills he needed. He got his Nobel Prize. So yeah, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. say he had huts, but he, was, he just built a big lab and was continuing to do things. But, you yeah. know, it was, yeah. it was, he was a smart guy and it was very resourceful. Anyway, the book, Cancer <laughs> Virus Hunters, it's really good. And it's written by, so Greg Morgan is a, professor at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. He is an associate professor specializing in the history and philosophy of science. So I think it's really nicely wow. written and it's not it's not one of these um, watered down books for people who don't want to learn the science. It's got all the science in there, but it's explained in a good way. So I kind of think it's nice. Yeah, very cool. Let me, I'll add that to my reading list. It reminds me, um, Lee Hartwell, um, so when I was a postdoc, Lee Hartwell was running the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And so he, he um, you know, wasn't, isn't known for studying viruses. He was studying Baker's yeast uh, to get at cell division, which ended up leading to a Nobel Prize, some of the first genetics um, uh, that relates to oncogenesis, et cetera, um, and when the cell cycle goes off the rails. But Lee used to say, at, I heard him at one of the Fred Hutch events say that he thought that maybe every cancer had a virus connection in there somehow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm, and so, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be as direct as some of the examples you were just talking about. Um, the like the Rouse sarcoma virus and you know directly leading to a tumor, but that they're even one step away or a couple steps away that the viruses were in that conversation that would that would lead to that. And that you know that certainly makes sense. I think depending on how you define it, when you think, when we're starting to think about immunotherapy or how our immune systems respond to um, yeah, viruses yeah. versus tumors and how there's some overlap or a Venn diagram there in that biology is kind of an interesting way of framing yeah, it or thinking about it. Someone else has mentioned that to me and asked me what I thought. I mean, I don't see connection. I mean, a lot of tumors mm -hmm. are caused by uh, mutations in genes that encode uh, regulatory proteins, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't see that there's a viral involvement, but maybe it's just that we haven't looked or it's not obvious. I mean, I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Yep. Uh, we have a listener pick from Ryan. Mm. I remember with viruses, they get renamed because of updated data and more characteristics are recorded. In this case, we're talking about zoology doing the same thing with birds. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, yeah. This can't, I saw this. Yeah. <laughs> this is an Associated Press article. Birds in North America will be renamed to avoid any harmful historical associations with people. They will no longer be named after people. Uh, okay. Uh, Yikes. And Ryan yeah. continues. Um, next year, the, the organization will begin to re rename around 80 species found in the U.S. Okay. I guess it's being based on more based on science than someone's name now, right? That's the idea. Yeah, I guess so. But this is, you know, it's, it's getting into some controversial stuff as we think about, you know, all of all the way out to cancel culture sort of energy. But um, even just from a, you know, just sort of like operationally, I mean, we as virologists, right, we're grappling with this as well. So monkeypox yeah, being mpox being, and, um, you know, in some cases taken to some extremes where, you know, if viruses all move to Latin names and sort of numbers and alphabet soup, then we really lose sort of our ability to quickly kind of grab audiences or to kind of communicate across disciplines, et cetera. And um, yeah, maybe there's an echo here for the bird watchers too. If you've, you know, you know, the species by its name that's been around for centuries or more, and then all of a sudden it's sort of a shifting landscape. And I'm not yeah. like saying that everything should never change, but there's, yeah, balancing that I think is super challenging. 
not just in virology, but bird watching and across the board. All right, that'll do it for this Twevo 95. Fantastic. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twevo. If you like what we do, we'd love your financial support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, and um, if you want to send us questions or comments, well, you can come here on our live stream, or you can send them to Twevo at microbe.tv, especially if you want to do a pick. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, Noir has just supported us um, with uh, a super chat, so let me thank oh, awesome. Noir. Thank you. I thank you, Noir, for your for <laughs> very cool your support of science communication. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, now Zeldi is at cellvolution.org and also L Early Bird, both on Twitter and Blue Sky. Thanks, Nels. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Vincent. Great to be together. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'm also Prof VRR on Twitter and eventually on Blue Sky as mm -hmm. well. Music. Oh, I wanted to thank everyone for coming today. Yeah. I appreciate your joining us and listening to us, Yammer. It was a little quiet chat, but that's okay. And I want to thank okay. Tom, Les, Steph, and uh, Barb Mack for moderating today. And thank you all. Uh, we will be back in about a month. So stay tuned. Check out the schedule. Uh, by the way, the music you hear on Twevo, which I'm going to start right now, is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, be curious.